Graves on Gridiron with Richard Graves. The NFL is headed to Germany. The Kansas City Chiefs and Miami Dolphins making the trip across the pond to play in Frankfurt this weekend. The first of two back-to-back games being staged by the NFL in Germany over the next couple of weeks. But before we get to that Week 9 matchup, where to begin? So much to get across. The trade deadline passed on Tuesday. Frantic moves made across the league in the final couple of hours before we hit that deadline. Then came the news that the Las Vegas Raiders are now headed in a different direction. Both the general manager and head coach are gone. Antonio Pierce will take on the role of interim head coach to the end of the season. And as for the show in week eight, we were back to winning ways. A 2-1 and one record against the line, getting ever closer to 500 on the season now. 10-12 and 12 on the season. So much to get across in this week's edition of Graves on Gridiron. So much so, we needed to bring in a special guest. We've got one. He's a big Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan to boot. So without further ado, let's turn the page and look ahead to week nine in the NFL. Graves on Gridiron with Richard Graves. So much to get to in this week's edition of the podcast. Uh, Before we head towards the week nine slate of games, let's take a a breath and look back at some of the news lines that have gone through uh, this week, building up to to this this weekend's matchups. We will start with the Las Vegas Raiders. And I'm delighted to say joining me is someone who has no affiliation to the Raiders at all. For his sins, he's a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. He's also a former first-class <laughs> cricketer, T20 Cup winner. You'll know him better from watching cricket on uh, Sky Sports, Channel 5, hearing him on Test Match Special. It is a very warm welcome to my good friend, Charles Dagnall. Great to have you with us, Charles. Oh, Richard, I'm absolutely delighted. You know, it's a, it's a real problem in my industry that, that I am the only one that is an NFL geek, you know, and, and I love the sport, have done for, for since the mid-80s, and I have no outpost to talk about it with anybody. No one wants to talk about it with me. So now, unfortunately for you, I'm going to have to just sort of get out all of this inner NFL that I want to talk about. So obviously, I realise we've only got half an hour or so, uh, but it's, I'm just thrilled to be on. And thank you for inviting me um, and and plenty to get through. Yeah, absolutely. And we've spoken about um, getting you on the show before. I never quite envisaged it being such a busy week of NFL news when we finally managed to agree a time and date. Um, but before we, we discuss all of that, <laughs> you, you're going to have to tell me, how, how on earth did you ever become a Tampa Bay Buccaneer? fan and what's more how how on earth did you become a fan of a team that acquired Tom Brady won the Super Bowl the very next season and for all the belly aching I sometimes read from you on (laughs) on your social media outlets you've won a Super Bowl in the last three years so nobody listening to this show me included on it can have any sympathy with you at all Uh, no absolutely and people will think that oh you're a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan because of Tom Brady oh no. no 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 I've been a Tampa Bay Buccaneer since the age of eight. We went on a family holiday to, to <laughs> Florida, the Disney World and all of that sort of stuff. And mum and dad actually said, oh, we'd like to, to take in a game of American football. So they, pre-season was on. I didn't know this at the time, but pre-season was on. And they had a game at the old uh, Hulahan Stadium uh, in Tampa. And you've got to remember, when you're eight years old and the biggest thing you've ever seen is Burnden Park, the old Bolton Wanderers football uh, stadium, which was, well, I don't know, 20,000 seat capacity, something like that, really dank. It had a, it had a, yes. a, a, a supermarket in the away end, uh, you know, that big Normid superstore. And, and so at eight years old, when you're walking up in the blinding sunshine to this 77,000 seat bowl which was it didn't have a roof it didn't have it didn't have covers for people because the weather was so good it It didn't have rain it's mind-blowing it's absolutely mind-blowing and then seeing all these 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 sportsmen dressed in helmets and colorful clothing and cheerleaders and all i'm going what the hell is this eight years old i'm going this is ace what's this and so from there on in, we watched we watched Tampa Bay versus the Atlanta Falcons in 1985, 1986, something like that. And it just grabbed me. It grabbed me from there. Little did I know the pain and suffering that supporting the Tampa Bay Buccaneers would give me over the last sort of 30-odd, 40 years. Um, <laughs> and we had... 
many, many, many years of Thin until the Tony Dungy era. And you can go back to Doug Williams and stuff, but that was that was before my time. Um, and, you know, until the Tony Dungy era, the, the Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, John Lynch, uh, you know, sort of era of defence, we didn't have any success. We had, you know, fairly continued success until we won the Super Bowl in 2001. Uh, and then we had 20 years of miserableness uh, under a variety of different head coaches and a variety of different quarterbacks uh, until Tom came in and won it for us. And do you know what? I, I like what they did there. They went all in on Brady, all in on the Super Bowl. They had a roster which was ready to win a Super Bowl. They just didn't have the right guy under centre. They got that. And so, yeah, two Super Bowl wins. I'm delighted about that. But there's been a more thin than thick in my Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, fandom. Uh, so that is how I became a, a Bucks fan, uh, for better or worse. And uh, and now I'm afraid I think we're seeing us on the downslide. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's the story of a, a long-suffering sports fan, isn't it? You've got to ride the highs with the lows. Um, congratulations on, on that Super Bowl win. Not jealous at all. 27 years and counting if you support the Dallas Cowboys. Just putting it out there. <laughs> uh, we, we'll move swiftly on, Charles. Um, I, and there might be oh, one well. fan base that's more maybe long-suffering. This year. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's, as Jerry Jones says, <laughs> that we're always Super Bowl or bust. It's been more bust recently. Um, but there's one organisation yeah. whose fans might argue they've had it even worse than that. Let's talk Las Vegas Raiders, they they moved from Oakland to Las Vegas to a shiny new stadium several years ago. They they had John Gruden as head coach. He left. In came Josh McDaniels. Um, David Ziegler was the GM. They make the move to bring Devontae Adams to Vegas. This offseason, they go for Jimmy Garoppolo. It just hasn't worked out for them. And then overnight came the news that Mark Davis, the owner, has decided to move on. Um, and let's not forget, Tom Brady, I believe, has s- some, um, I don't know whether he has any say in this decision, but certainly there was talk of him being involved with the Raiders early this season at, a, at an ownership level. But uh, whatever the, the reason, Antonio Pierce, the former Giants linebacker, is now the interim head coach at the end of the season. And it is another new dawn for this Raiders organization who are, are just struggling to find their way. Yeah, they are. And, and you know what? Well, you actually broke the news to me. It was 4 a.m., uh, you say, and I was tucked <laughs> up in my bed having a, a beautiful, dreamless sleep. Uh, and then you break the news to me that, that Josh McDaniels... As every sensible person is, Charles. Well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Apart from you, who's just going down the social medias in the early <laughs> hours of the morning, and just which is what a good broadcaster does, not like me. Um I Look, this is no surprise, is it? I mean, I, I think it was starting to crash and burn from fairly early on. Uh, the I don't necessarily think that the knives were out for Josh McDaniels. I think they wanted success under him. But I think also is that what it has proved, given his time in Denver, given the sort of uh, the route that he's taken in Las Vegas, that I just don't think uh, head coaching is for Josh McDaniels. It was a side that looked pretty much out of sorts. They've got some serious pieces of that. You look at the, you know, Max Crosby, arguably one of the best defensive ends in the um, uh, in the NFL. You've got weapons in Devante Adams, Josh Jacobs finally signed his contract, and you've got a sort of mid-level QB in Jimmy Garoppolo, but something doesn't seem right there, and I think they've made the right decision. Now, I would argue, and I don't know what you think, that in the majority of cases it's better to wait until the end of a season to make a coaching change. I would say that's a general statement. But if ever there was a a time where a a side was in a funk, a a franchise was in a bit of a funk, it seemed like the Las Vegas Raiders and something needed to happen sooner rather than later. Do you agree with that? I I, I agree that in an ideal world, you'd like to maintain the status quo until you have an opportunity to do something about it. I mean, for, for Antonio Pierce now, you, you're looking at the final 10 weeks of the regular season, the trade deadline's gone, you can't really make any moves, you've got the hand you've been dealt with, and you only hope from his perspective that he can make a strong enough impression that he's right there in the thick of it when um, when it comes to deciding the, the new head coach. I mean, remember the last time the Raiders did this, when John Gruden left, it was also mid-season. Uh, the, the name of uh, one of his coaching staff that 
took his place on interim role escapes me now. But I do recall he did a, a fantastic job and never really got a sniff when it came to, to the long-term appointment. But you look at the last couple of results that the Raiders wasn't had, it? particularly... Uh, a, that's right, yes. Yes, that's right. Um, it did, did a wonderful job. It wasn't enough, so it, it turned out. Um, but you look at the last couple of results, a defeat to the Chicago Bears, and then... It, it was close for a while against the Detroit Lions on Monday night, but it wasn't ever really close. They weren't ever really in it. They had a pick six, which sort of kept the scoreboard um, tight. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back, I think. It will be interesting to see um, what direction they go in from here for sure. But we'll keep an eye on that. They, they've got the uh, the beleaguered New York Giants uh, next up, who uh, are struggling a little bit themselves at the moment. So maybe the hope is that, uh, that just a change, change of face, change of, of voice might be enough to do the trick. If they lose that one, well, I've got a few Raiders friends, Charles, that, that might not want to talk about the NFL uh, much more this season. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. That's going to be one that's that's going to be uh, a tough watch. I mean, it was a tough watch to Giants and the Jets the other day. Uh, but but I can't imagine the viewing figures being as high for that particular game as some of the ones that we're featuring in this particular <laughs> podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> let, yes, I, I think you might have a point there. Um, let's move on to the, the trade deadline as well before we get to the week <clears throat> nine matchups, because there were some big moves made um, on Monday night and particularly Tuesday night as we got closer to the deadline. Uh, the New York Giants, with perhaps the, the biggest signal yet that they're already looking ahead to next year, um, trading away veteran defensive tackle Leonard Williams to the Seattle Seahawks. Um, they, they got a second round pick. Um, and a fifth round pick in in return, which s- seems a steep price to pay. Certainly, the Giants will be happy with that. And um, the other big moves that really jumped off the page: first of all, the Washington Re- uh, Washington Commanders, should I say, were heavy in the the deadline day market on Tuesday. We're moving on Monte Sweat, the defensive end, to Chicago. But perhaps more surprisingly, the decision to to move on from Chase Young, sending him to the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, They get a third round pick back for a player that they took number two overall in the draft just several years ago. Um, Looking ahead for them, I would say it says we're rebuilding and perhaps shows uh, a proactive approach from the new ownership. From the San Francisco 49ers perspective, Charles, this defensive front, which was already bordering (laughs) on elites, one of the best in the NFL, just get stronger. Remember, they added Randy Gregory as well from Denver, Denver yeah. a couple of yeah. weeks ago. They have stocked up on pass rushes. They're all in this year. Yeah, they really are. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, of all of the sides that I didn't think de- needed defensive line help, the San Francisco 49ers was was right up there. Um, I didn't chase you. I, I actually think this is one of those weird ones that it could work out for both sides. Chase Young hasn't had the impact that a number two overall uh, should actually have. He's coming into a contract year uh, as well, and he's going to want to get paid. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think actually a change of scenery, even though it's not been a huge amount of time at the Commanders, I actually think a change of scenery for him um, might we might actually get to see the best of him, especially when you consider that he's. You know, on the other side of him, potentially, is going to be Nick Bosa. So the focus is going to be probably, you know, you want to double-team Nick Bosa. But, oh, by the way, you've got Chase Young uh, uh, on the other side and a fearsome uh, linebacking core as well. So I am, I think this works out well for the San Francisco 49ers because he's still very much upside Chase Young. If he can perform to the type of levels that he is actually capable of, then the San Francisco 49ers are going to be in... You know, they're, they're going to be even more threatening on the defensive side of the ball uh, than they were before, which is difficult to believe. Um, I, 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 the, the one that it's not what you want to hear if you're one of the other the 31 teams in the NFL. Was, was, no, no, no. It's like it's, it's if, if they added, I don't know, if the, if the San Francisco 49ers added Jonathan Taylor uh, before the trade deadline, you go, well, well you just got Christopher. Christian McCaffrey as well. Can you imagine? It, that's that's kind of what is happening. Um, I think uh, the, the the intriguing one for me is Montez Sweat going to Chicago. Now, now Monte, if you're they're both coming into contract years, I think. I I think Sweat has performed yep. sensationally well for the Washington Redskins. You're gonna have to pay someone 
Yeah, I, I, and it, overhauling your defensive line like this, you know, that was what Washington probably, I would argue, Washington's greatest strength was their defensive line. I, I was surprised that they let Montez Sweat go, but sooner or later, you're going to have to pay some of these people. Um, and the 49ers might come into that you know, with, with Chase Young. I, I think Chicago have actually got the better out of that deal. That's just a personal opinion. I know they're paid for him, um, but but uh, with 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 high draft picks. But I just think that that um, the Chase Young the Chase Young trade works. I think well for both sides. As for and then just just going back to Leonard Williams. I mean, you look at you look at Seattle. You know that 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 defense needed assistance. Leonard Williams going there is a. I think I think I, I, yes, it's a high price. But I think Seattle willing to pay that uh, to, to strengthen up that defensive line and get a superstar for a second round pick and a fifth potentially. Um, yeah, I, I, I quite like that. But from from your perspective, do you, do, are you in alignment there? I, I think the Chase Young one is an intriguing one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what the San Francisco 49ers have looked at is, you know, they've lost three straight and we've perhaps begun to see a few chinks in the armory of Brock Purdy, still a young quarterback learning his trade. And I think Kyle Shanahan um, and Curve probably looked at it and said, well, look, the defense is the strength of this team. If defensively we're strong, we give our quarterback, who we know can play, every chance. So that's one of the reasons I think they made this move. Equally for the Seahawks, they look at the division now, they're suddenly top of the NFC West with a 5-2 and two record, um, and they think, right, fine, we, we've we seen what, what happened with the Bengals and 49ers in Week 7. We, we've got two games against the, the 49ers. Yeah. We need to get after the quarterback. I, I think Leonard Williams helps them uh, do that. Uh, one other move I, I want to highlight as well, Josh Dobbs uh, moving for the second time already this season, uh, moving to Minnesota from the Arizona Cardinals. Obviously, we all saw um, the horrific injury for, for Kirk Cousins on Sunday. Heart goes out to him, especially, I don't know if you saw this, Charles, but he, he tears his Achilles tendon on Sunday. On Monday, he's attending a community event signing autographs for, for young fans. You've been a professional sportsman. Um, obviously, to get to that level, you have to be fairly single-minded but to be the, the best in your trade. Do you know of any other um, fellow professional or professional sportsman that you can imagine would put himself in that situation just 24 hours after a season-ending injury? You hope that pro sportsmen do that and realise what it means to actually play the role of a pro sportsman. Pro sportsman isn't just going on to the field and doing what you do and then shutting everything else out. I was told a long time ago when I was when I was um, playing cricket, and look, I was bang average. I, you know, nowhere near the England side. I was I burgled a career for ten years. Now, when there's kids coming up, I used to sign every single one. Every single one. I don't care if it's a scrap of paper and they're going to throw it away. I don't care if it's a napkin. They're going to sign absolutely every every single one. And the reason was an old pro back at Warwickshire told me, he said, sign them because you, there's going to be a time where they're not going to stop asking. They're going to stop asking. And and that is part of the role of a professional sportsman. Now, now from Kirk Cousins, now this we're talking, <laughs> you're talking from the differences between... County cricket, where like 13 people used to watch, and one of the biggest stars and highest paid stars in the NFL, who is who is um, upholding a commitment he made to go and uh, do this event. He was there with a little uh, sort of knee bike. He, you know, one of those things where you rest your, you rest your leg on it so his, his Achilles yep. was, was um, uh, in the air, it was, it was lifted, uh, and... Uh, and, and so he went along there, did that, and you just go, that's a pro. That is a proper pro. He's upholding his commitment. He said he was going to do it. He's going to do it. And for a kid to see that, and not just the fact that he's seen Kirk Cousins, that he's seen Kirk Cousins come in given what he's just been through, and that I think that makes more of a difference to youngsters than, than seeing the touchdowns thrown to seeing the great plays made, to seeing the social media. I just thought that was high class, top class. And he's he had a lot of goodwill anyway, but I think that just adds on 
to that. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that, Charles. Um, and if you want to see a bit more about what we're talking about, you can go onto my Twitter account, Richard Graves One. Scroll back down through the the various posts, but you'll see it there. Yeah, exactly, Charles. Keep scrolling, um, but you'll see it there. From I think it was Tuesday morning, the post. Absolutely phenomenal, I think. Yeah, and definitely. For, for all the criticism he's had nationally, you look at instances like that. He is absolutely the type of leader you want on your team and in your locker room. We wish him all the very best and certainly wish yeah, for him yeah. to have a speedy recovery. Um, OK, let's turn our attention then to week nine, because after three games in the UK, in London, in October, November's turned the page on the NFL, and we're now heading to Frankfurt, Germany. And it's a mouth-watering clash, <laughs> I've got to tell you. The Miami Dolphins versus the Kansas City Chiefs, both teams with a 6-2 and two record. The Chiefs head into it as two-and-a-half-point favourites, according to the odds makers. But let's be honest, Charles, for the fans turning up, and it will be a sellout crowd um, in Frankfurt, I had the ex- uh, privilege of being there for a watch party when when the Buccaneers were playing in Munich last year, and 5,000 fans turned up in Frankfurt's um, to you. Deutsche Bank there Stadium. That's a CU. Not anything to do with the <laughs> They are there to see you. Don't I'll I say it for Charles. you. I will say it for you. Uh, however, on this occasion, I guarantee they're here, here to see Patrick yeah. Mahomes and Travis Kelsey go head to head against Tua Tonga-Vailoa and Tyree Kill. Granted, those four players won't like to be on the field at any point um, at the same time, but they're, they're, two, they're four of the elite players in the NFL right now. And these are the sort of games that you just turn the TV on because you want to see them go up and down that field against each other. And they have landed a, a plum matchup for this one. Oh, Frankfurt are rubbing their hands. They cannot believe <laughs> how fortunate they are, how dearly London would have liked to have had this particular fixture because it's the one that really stood out in the calendar, even before now. You know, if the yeah. Dolphins could be the Dolphins that we that we have seen in previous uh, in in recent history, uh, that explosive offense, Jalen Waddle, Tyreek Hill, Tua Tagovailoa is back and healthy, um, uh, and the running game, which has just blown D- Devon Achan, um, along with Raheem M- Mostert, which is a proper thunder and lightning type of of, of rushing attack. <laughs> Let's just go, go through this Dolphins. Number one in offense, number one in rushing, number one in passing yards. Um, They are granted 21st defensively, but I think due to the nature of that, I don't think it's a bad defense, actually. I think it's a solid enough defense, especially given... Well, and and let's add to that. Let's add to that as well, because... You know, you've got this lightning fast offense and then you you want to get a bit stronger. Can we pull someone in that's been injured? Oh, hang on. I know we've got Jalen Ramsey Ramsey, makes his debut, immediately has a pick. And the the standards are that high that albeit tongue in cheek. You have the head coach on the podium (laughs) afterwards saying a bit disappointed in Jalen. Actually, he promised me a pick six. All we got was a pick field goal. Absolutely. I loved that. And I love the atmosphere that Mike McDaniel has got around the Dolphins, you know, it's very relaxed. In fact, there, there is a freedom in their play. He doesn't get overly flustered, really, when things don't necessarily go their way, but he's quite philosophical and fun. And I think that it, everything starts at the top in sport, I feel, Richard. And and I think if you're if that is the vibes that the head coach is giving off, that it actually reverberates around the locker room and they're able to play with it. And if something doesn't go right, they're sort of at the opinion, well, we'll get it right next time and we'll do something ridiculous there. And this is an intriguing matchup to me because I don't know how the Chiefs coming into this game off the back of defeat at Denver. You talk about this. Miami went to, or Denver went to Miami and Miami put 70 on them. And then the Chiefs go to Denver and can barely get, can barely get the ball across midfield. I, I, if ever there was a time to play the Kansas City Chiefs, I think it's now. In that I understand why the Chiefs are two and a half point favourites, but they're not an hour ahead, so you don't have to deal with the noise and and the um, uh, you know the, the the crescendo of sound that comes from Arrowhead and the difficulties getting plays in and getting communication on that offensive line. I think. Uh, Patrick Mahomes wasn't very well last week, and I think that had something to do with the type of this play. Uh, at, uh, at Denver, but they're coming off the back of a loss. You don't have to play them at Arrowhead, 
I think if you could pick a perf- more perfect scenario to play the Kansas City Chiefs, now they've got their groove, you know, Detroit beating them in week one, you know, then they needed to be woken up. They did. Um, but I just fancy that that if you're Miami, I think you're delighted that this game is in Frankfurt. Yeah, and another player who goes under the radar that's missing from this matchup and probably won't get a, a lot of attention because of it, but I think he's a big loss for the Kansas City Chiefs. Linebacker Nick Bolton. You know, he marshals the yeah. centre of that field with the speed that we've already talked about, the crossing routes that you see from Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, let out. Um, I think he's a, a massive loss. I think we saw that in the defeat to, to the Broncos last weekend. Mm-hmm. I, and I, I looked down the, the statistics coming into this. It was a little bit surprising when I saw that Chiefs were just the 12th ranked scoring offense. They're, they're only averaging uh, a fraction over 23 points a game. Compare that to Miami, who are putting over 33 points a game on the board. As you quite rightly say, the number one ranked scoring offense. I I, I see why the, the, the line has the, the Chiefs as favorites, but I think that's more about reputation than it is what we're seeing on the field um, right now. Uh, and time will tell if I'm right. I think this might end up being a a bit of a mismatch on Sunday. I think the the Miami Dolphins have got something of a chip on their shoulder. They can't beat the Buffalo Bills in the big game. Can't beat the Philadelphia Eagles in the big game. Well, okay, let's see how you do against the Super Bowl champions on the national stage, um, showcasing the NFL in Frankfurt, Germany. Huge opportunity for them. I'll let you go first. How do you see it going? Uh, I see if, I, I see if, if the Chiefs can get Isaiah Pacheco going, and they can keep Miami, Miami, Miami's offense off the field. I think that is, and I know that Miami can score within a split second and in a blink of an eye, they can change it. Remember the Tyreek Hill revenge game, uh, you could call it, um, which no one else is calling it, but I am. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I do, I, I'm leaning your way as well. I think Miami, Miami have got a hunger. They've not won a Super Bowl. They've not, they're still trying to achieve that. They're on the upward curve they've got all the pieces in place pretty much and they are hungry for it now Kansas City aren't as hungry they will argue this I've seen this in sport and I've actually seen this in the world of cricket at this moment in time you know I think I think the hunger is there the element is there for the Miami Dolphins it's a really good acid test for them they might meet each other again come January um but I am I, I I'm hoping for a high scoring affair uh, but I think the Chiefs and Andy Reid will game plan to try and just break the Dolphins' defense down slowly and surely. So I have the Dolphins winning it, but not by a lot. Do they cover at two and a half points? Yeah, I think they do, but only just. I'm right there with you. If they're winning it, they're covering. I think the Dolphins upset the form book here. Yeah. That's if you believe what the line makers um, <laughs> suggest. I think the Dolphins are the form team. Yeah. Take the Miami Dolphins to cover at plus 2.5, and both me and Charles think they'll win it outright. Okay, game two of the three we pick, pick every week is specifically the reason you are on this oh, show, God. Charles Dagnall, to bring us your expertise, your insight. You've followed this Buccaneers team since the age of eight. <laughs> Not giving any secrets away, but that's 39 years. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Um, they go to Houston to take on the Texans both teams with a three and four record Uh, the Houston Texans two and a half point favorites at home against the Buccaneers Uh, you've probably watched every game this season uh, Charles so tell me what you see and tell me whether or not the Buccaneers can turn things around under Baker Mayfield and get a win in this one Um, I think they can but this is one of the reasons that this is frustrating it's really frustrating being a Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And you will have seen this probably on my social see, media I, I feeds. love this because already I can see the pain is, expression on your I, face. I hated the signing of Baker Mayfield. And this is not anything to do with Baker Mayfield. I think he's a, really, he's a good guy, he's a good player, he's a good quarterback. But he'll win you just enough games to make sure that you get a really mid-level draft pick. You can, he'll win you six or seven and maybe even eight games. And especially given the division they're in, I wanted the Bucks post Brady to actually have a re- rehaul. You look at who's coming out of college at the moment. You know, Caleb Williams is out there, and some of these sides, like the Houston Texans, for argument's sake, if they didn't have a great season, or the Carolina Panthers at this moment in time, they've got their number one pick. They're not in the market for a quarterback. Well, I think the Bucks are, and so given the roster, which is an aging roster, 
Tampa Bay. Um, they are on the side for me that they're getting older, and I think they're on the downslide. And I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of a turnaround a bit more sooner. So I think this is a uh, they're they're not going to be very exciting the Buccaneers, but they'll be kind of good enough and solid enough. They've got no rushing game, no rushing game whatsoever. The lot dead last in the NFL. So the Baker's going to have to win it. You're going to have to get Mike Evans more involved, Chris Godwin as well. They're having pretty steady seasons as well. But somehow you've got to try and get your rushing game going against the Houston Texans side, which I believe is on the absolute flip of what the Bucs are. They are young. They are on the up. They've got an engaging and, and hungry coach in D'Amico Ryans. They've got, listen to this. I, did, I actually did some preparation for you here, Richard. Um, <laughs> you look at their, their skill set players, right? CJ Stroud, second round overall. He's nine touchdowns, one interception, and man, does he throw a pretty ball. I really like him. And I think he has been the one. You know, Will Levis has actually had a great game in the previous um for the Tennessee Titans. But he, of all the quarterbacks taken, is the one that has stood out. And I think he he is, is the Houston Texans would be delighted that he actually fell to them. Damian Pierce, running back, 23 years old. Nico Collins, 24 years old. Tank Dellu, they got in the second round from SMU yes, last year, 23 years old. This is a young, hungry, upward trending side. They've actually, I would have thought, outperformed expectations already this year. And uh, I don't know how long Derek Stingley's going to be out. He was on injured reserve. But a, a defense as well, which under D'Amico Ryans, is performing very nicely indeed. Will Anderson on the other side of the line. Um, so I, I think both sides are trending in different directions, but they're kind of meeting at this point in the middle. So, so as one goes up, the other's going down, and they're sort of crossing each other. So I actually think it could be quite a, a close affair, this. Um, I have got the Houston Texans winning it. Uh, And I have got them winning it by, again, maybe a field goal. I think it's going to be one of these games. It's a 20 to 17 type of game. Uh, It's going to be close and cagey. Bucks defense is still pretty reasonable. Houston defense is. It neither can run the ball, really. Uh, So both quarterbacks are going to have to win it in the air. Your thoughts? Well, well, here's the thing. I I also think it'll be a tight game. I don't think it's going to be one for the purists. Um, the, the the premise of success oh. for the Buccaneers this season has been do not turn the ball over. Our defence will yeah. keep us in it. You just need to make a couple of plays. And by and large, Baker Mayfield's been pretty good at doing that. They, they rank second in the league when it comes to giveaways this season. They've only given the ball away six times. Their defence tied with the Dallas Cowboys, and we know how opportunistic that defence has turned to be with 13 takeaways this season. When they have lost games, it's because they've turned the ball over. I think what you see with the Houston Texans, on the other hand, like you say, a young, up-and-coming side. Derek Stingley, their uh, big defensive back, gone with a hamstring until at least the back end of November. On the offensive side, Mm -hmm. veteran receiver Robert Woods, also out injured. I think they're two big misses. I think you saw that influence last week in that game against the Carolina Panthers when the Panthers kept it tight, kept it close. And then when it mattered most, game on the line, this young Texans defense gave up a 15-play drive, which resulted in a game-winning walk-off field goal. So I actually think that if Baker Mayfield and co. can look after this ball on Sunday in Houston, they are absolutely in this game because I think the Buccaneers' defense is still good enough to make crucial plays at crucial times. So I'm going to be a little bit less pessimistic than you, Charles. I'm going to take the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to cover at plus 2.5. I think experience is the key in this. And I will be cards on the table. If Houston turned the ball over and get takeaways, they win this game. But if Baker Mayfield does what he's actually been put in this position to do, look after the ball, be surgical, make sure it's an error-free game, a game manager, if you like, then I think the Buccaneers have every chance of winning it. And that's why I'm taking the Bucs at plus 2.5. Just a final note on this, Richard, is that the Buccaneers haven't turned the ball over because they don't do anything with it. <laughs> they don't run it they can't run it they just bash into the offensive line and fall down and then Baker isn't going to throw the ball over seven yards anyway so of course they're not going to turn the ball over I, 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 I like it though I see I see your point and this is this is the thing 
it, it, could, it, it genuinely, I think the Houston Texans are at home, though, uh, as well at Reliance Stadium. Uh, I just, like I like that. I think it's going to be KG, and a field goal could win it for either side. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a split decision on this one. Charles is going against the team that he idolises and lives and breathes every week. <laughs> I, I am going to be a little bit more objective. So I'm taking bad. the Buccaneers to cover on this one. Um, OK, let's move on to the third and final game in this week's podcast. For me, you might say I would say this. I think it is the game of the week. The 5-2 and two Dallas Cowboys going into the city of brotherly love to take on the best record in the NFL, the 7-1 and one Philadelphia Eagles. There will be no brotherly love offered to America's team when they go into <laughs> Philly on, on Sunday afternoon. Um, it, it, it's a game, with, you know, there's two, they, these two teams play each other twice, obviously, in the NFC East over the course of the season. If the Eagles win, they cement their position not only as the NFC East leaders, but also put themselves in pole position for that number one seed in the NFC as well. Um, Of course, that was a title they won last season. If the Cowboys win, everything's then up in the air. It brings into play the likes of the San Francisco 49ers, the Seattle Seahawks, the Cowboys, obviously, and then only half a game back from the Eagles, knowing they've got to host them in Dallas in November as well. Look, NFC's clashes of this stature don't often disappoint. I don't think this one is. I think it's a mouth-watering matchup. I think it's a mouth-watering matchup. I'll t- I'll give you my two, Penneth, after <laughs> yours, Cowboys fan. Come on, you've put me on the spot with the Buccaneers. Come on, how's it going to go? Well, you- you'll be delighted to know that I'm, I'm going to sit a little bit on the fence of this because we're... The, the total oh, points line breeze. is 45 and a half <laughs> points in this game. So I'm not even going to ask you if you don't want to, to, yeah. to give me a winner in this. We're, we're going to concentrate on that. But th- this is the key, ultimately. You've got the opportunistic defense of the Dallas Cowboys. Deron Bland has three pick sixes already through the first eight weeks of the season. The record mm-hmm. In all-time NFL history is four pick sixes for the season. We're barely halfway through. He's already got three. He was never the starting corner on that right side of the the field for for Dallas. Trayvon Diggs went down uh, prior to the week three matchup in San Fran. He comes in. He's been lights out. However, I will say, if you are prepared to put a double move on him, he can be caught out. And when you look at A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard and co., you know that Nick, Nick Sirianni's looked at this. They will look to make Deron Bland bite and try and expose him deep. Um, AJ Brown, look, is there a better player right now? Not just receiver, player in the so. NFL. No. He's had six straight games he... where he's had at least 127 receiving yards. That's never happened in the history of the NFL. Add on to that, he's had 49 catches and five touchdowns as well. That one-handed grab he made against the Commanders last week, nothing short of oh, sensational. Ridiculous. Um, look, this, this as much as the, the, the Dallas Cowboys, the strength of the team is this defense, this is the biggest test that they, they've faced all season. And I put the 49ers in, in that bracket as well. Um, offensively, I will say things have changed. Through weeks one through five, Dallas weren't really very good. Um, they went through a four-game stretch yeah. where in three of those games they didn't score uh, 20, 20, more than 20 points. But things have changed in the last two weeks. The wins over the Chargers and then last weekend um, that blowout winner over the Rams. Weeks one to five, listen to this. Passes attempted out of the pocket. They were ninth in the NFL. The last two games, quarterback m- making passes out of the pocket now seventh. So they're moving Dak Prescott around, trying to use his mobility. Um, designed runs, weeks one to five, they were fourth in the NFL. They've moved away from that the last two weeks. Designed runs, now down at 25th over the last two games. Run yardage as a proportion of the total yardage, weeks one to five, they ranked third in the NFL the last two games. That's gone down to 23rd. So the emphasis of this offense has changed. Will Nick Sirianni and his defensive front have noticed this? You bet. Are Dallas as good as they now might think they are from the last two weeks? Confidence is going to be high. We're going to find out on Sunday. Either way, Mm. I will tell you now that you look back over the history of this game, um, and and when you look at at total points, I think it's something ridiculous. Like uh, five in one of their last five meetings, I think I read, has had fewer than 
uh, 54 total points in this game. So you set me a line at 45 and a half for this game with these two yeah. teams on the field. I'm taking the over every day of the week. Yeah. Yeah, and I am as well. Uh, 100%. And I think uh, it, it is a mouth-watering matchup. You would say it's the the one game that uh, is, is the most keenly anticipated one. Uh, we've already covered Miami versus Kansas City. Can I just say, we've covered Miami versus Kansas City. That, for me, is the game of the week. You would say, being a <laughs> Cowboys fan. Uh, that, but do you know what it is? These NFC East um, matchups are always, I don't care who who's involved, Actually, there is always something on them, given the history mm. of the teams uh, 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 that are playing. And I, I find I don't think the Philadelphia Eagles are actually playing their best football at this moment in time. You look at Jalen Hurts; he's been picked, and you were talking about Deron Bland. He's been picked off eight times this year. Jalen Hurts. I don't think he is quite as as smooth and rhythmic as he ha- and as he was last year. It doesn't matter when they keep tush-pushing or brotherly shoving their way <laughs> to first downs and touchdowns. They might as well just do six of, the, uh, like four of those every every single, and just work their way down the field by pushing Jalen Hurts off the backside. Um, I, the Dallas defense, I actually, I, I watched them. I, I, the offense, they, they managed to get C.D. Lamb more involved. And that was something that they wanted to do over the last couple of weeks. They managed to do that last week against the Rams. He was absolutely electric. And when you've got playmakers such as that, you've got to get him the ball. And they do have playmakers, the, the, the Dallas Cowboys. I think this is another acid test on deck. Now, being the Cowboys quarterback, you are always going to have that question mark over you. Are you the guy to lead you to the promised land to get your, yourself a Lombardi trophy? I think in the majority of cases, when put when push comes to shove, I don't think necessarily Dak has stepped up to the mark. This is a very good test yet again for an experienced quarterback going against a defense, a rush defense especially. You know, the Eagles' rush defense is very, very good. So Dak is going to have to try and win it. For, for the uh, for the Cowboys. Now, granted, you might pick up points on defense. Michael Parsons might get three interceptions and five safeties, and you might win it that way. But um, I just think that this game is on Dak at the link. It at night time, uh, the atmosphere is going to be electric, and this is one of these games where they don't. The Cowboys don't need Dak to go to sleep like he did against the Arizona Cardinals in that early part of the uh, early part of the year. So this is a step up time. For me, for Dak Prescott, I think I'm with you. I think there's going to be points. I think there's going to be big points in this. Uh, the Eagles and AJ Brown, I agree with you, is just staggering. I, I mean, he is the complete receiving threat. You stick him in one-on-one coverage, and he's coming down with the ball. That is a that's that's a given. So you've got to get safety help over there, and you've got to you've got to scheme really, really well. Uh, and that's to say, you've only got weapons for Jalen Hurts to, to use. I think DeAndre Swift uh, again is someone who the Philadelphia Eagles will rely on heavily. He's having a good season, really good pickup from Detroit last uh, in the off season, and he's having a very good season as well. But there are so many you could argue yourself in and out of. Any sort of scenario as it, to pick a winner. I'm going to go with the home side. I'm going to go uh, with with Philadelphia Eagles. But as regards the the point spread, yeah, I am overing on 45. 100. percent I am with you. Well, I will say this: when you've got the best record in football as the Eagles have now, seven and one. You cannot go against them. They've earned that as of right. The biggest knock I've seen on Philadelphia this season is that they're not winning games in a flashy enough fashion. Look, you don't win anything for playing well in September and October. (laughs) You you win things by playing well in January and February. And frankly, the only stat that matters is whether you win or lose. And the Eagles have been winning. However, I will give you some stats that should give the Dallas Cowboys fans hope. Dak Prescott, in his last eight games, outings against the Philadelphia Eagles, seven and one. Jalen Hurts has never beaten a Dallas Cowboys set side that has had Dak Prescott as the starting quarterback. In fact, his only win against Dallas came last October at the link when Cooper Rush was the starting quarterback. Um, and then you, you look at some other averages, Jalen Hurts only averages 274 yards per game uh, with a completion percentage of 59.3%. When playing this Cowboys defense, he has five touchdown passes, four interceptions against Dallas, 
And I, I think in his career, he's had over 30 rushing touchdowns. He's never found the end zone with his legs against the Cowboys. So there you go, Cowboys fans. I've given you everything to say you should win this game. <laughs> However, Philly, Philly fans, there's a reason you're, you're, you have the best record in football right now. You're at home. I, I think rightly you're the favourites for, for this game. And that's why, Ooh, frankly, I'm yeah. not touching who's winning or losing. I'll just take the over on total points. You, you, <laughs> you, see, you see, at least you're sitting on the fence with not picking a winner. I, as a proper fan, actually <laughs> went against my own side and said that we're going to lose. So, so you see, it's, I, I, knew, yeah, I knew you'd come up with some statistics that would sort of back your Cowboys fandom up. Uh, what, one thing I will say is, honestly... I'm going to be glued to it, absolutely glued to it. I think the Philadelphia Eagles, and you're right, they're winning games. I don't think they're playing their best football, which is actually a bit of a scary prospect, yeah. especially offensively. I, I think I think they can fine-tune a few things. And they've managed to get by and get to 7-1. and one. They will want the NFC Championship to go through Philadelphia, knowing that you don't want it to go through San Francisco. Absolutely. But that is, that is, I mean, even though they're having a little bit of a, a raw run of it at the moment, the Eagles don't care about that. Uh, the, the, they also don't want it to go through Detroit. And that is one possibility at, at, at this moment in time. So Can't um, believe you haven't mentioned Dallas there, Charles. Uh, and also uh, Dallas <laughs> as well. It, it could go, yeah, and it could go through Raymond James Stadium as well. Nah, stop <laughs> it. I can't, I can't lie about that. But it, it's going to be NFC East at the link, Dallas, Philadelphia, Sunday night. Oh, feed it to me, inject it into my veins, can't wait. Absolutely. Um, Charles Daniel, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. We will have to do this um, Ooh, yes, again, please. even if it's only so you can vent your NFL fandom. Yes, please. I've loved it. I absolutely love it. And love talking to you as well, which is great spending. Uh, even though we spend a little bit of time together in the summer, not nearly enough, and we'll have to uh, spend some time on the golf course. But other than that, this is lovely, and, and I would love to do it again, if you'll have me. Uh, absolutely, without hesitation. Just quickly, for, for those listening, Charles, where, where can they read about your opinions, find you, um, give it a plug? Uh, well, they can find me on, on cricket coverage at this moment in time. I'm actually doing the uh, World Cup highlights, um, which, if you're an England fan, is probably not worth watching. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then I'm going off to India for um, uh, to do the women's test matches. And we'll wait to see what the, the, the winter brings. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the Under-19 World Cup will wait and see. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, you can just hear me just... Now and again on X, or I mean, very rarely on X, but uh, but yeah, just just keeping across um, uh, keeping across social media channels at Charles Dagnall if you want to follow. Absolutely. Um, once again, thanks very much, Charles. Uh, just to recap, the three games uh, selected this week, we should give it. Um, an honorary mention to the, the Seahawks and Ravens, which is another massive matchup that's taking place this weekend. Uh, but we start in Germany at Frankfurt, where we're taking the Miami Dolphins to cover at plus 2.5. Charles and I are in agreement with that. Then it's off to Houston, Texas. The Buccaneers are in town. I've got the Buccaneers at covering at plus 2.5. Dagnall has gone against his team. He doesn't believe in, yes. in the Buccaneers down, down in Houston. So we're split on that before we finish up in the city of brotherly love, Cowboys Eagles on Sunday afternoon. Uh, take the over on total points, 45 and a half yes. points. As I always say, remember, first and foremost, folks, this is about enjoyment, having fun to accompany your entertainment on Sunday. Make sure you keep that in mind. Um, as always, you can read about the matchups that we've discussed on the show by going to rdgmedia.uk. Click on the Talking Sport app and there you will see week nine, overcoming the odds. Uh, three games to watch. Equally, get in touch on X with at Richard Graves One or on Instagram at RDG Media UK. It's been a blast. Charles Dagnall, thanks once again. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everybody. And everybody else, enjoy week nine. Let's do this all again next week. So long, everybody. Subscribe to Graves on Gridiron wherever you listen to podcasts. And keep up to date with the latest on Twitter. Search for Richard Graves One. That's Richard Graves, the number one. <laughs>